Joining me now is the senior editor at large at Newsweek, Josh Hammer. Josh, former Virginia factory worker Anthony Oliver, has become an overnight sensation with his heartfelt song, Rich Men North of Richmond. It went viral around two weeks ago and has hit now number one on Apple Music's top 100 charts, ahead of the likes of Taylor Swift. But we do have the usual suspects slamming it as populist right wing. Uh, they've said it's bigoted and divisive. No doubt, perhaps, because uh, many Republicans, many pro-Trump folk seem to like the song. Uh, let's have a look at, though, at the ordinary Americans from all types of backgrounds reacting to this song. I wish politicians Look out for miners, and not just miners on an island somewhere. Yeah. Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat, and the whole beast milking welfare. But God, if you're five foot three, and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bags of fudge rounds. Young men are putting themselves six feet in the ground, because all this damn country does is keep on kicking them down. Lord, it's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me, what? people like you. I yeah. wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is living in the new world. Josh, you've got people reduced to tears hearing that song and then you've got and I'm going to be quoting some later in the program, music critics and other assorted commentariats saying that this is some sort of a divisive right-wing anthem. Well, I'm not sure exactly what is supposed to be divisive about this, Rita. You know, it's actually not just liberals. It's actually even some establishment Republican magazines and affiliated organizations, I mean, National Review magazine, kind of the flagship of American conservatism in the pre-Trump era, you know, even they published a blog post from Mark Antonio Wright just condemning this song. I mean, what what would make someone want to condemn this? I mean, I, I just don't really understand it myself. And mm. Rita, by the way, I'm actually a huge country music fan, so it's very nice to see country music kind of mm. rise to, to the top of global attention. It's really, it's actually kind of the second country music song in a matter of months that's kind of went viral on political grounds. Yeah. We had Jason Aldean's song, Try That in a Small Town, and now we have Oliver Anthony kind of with this chart-topping hit. I mean, it, it's just unambiguously heartfelt, right? I mean, that is why people are being re are being reduced to tears mm. here. He's talking about a new world. And in this new world, Rita, I think that you have multiple forms of newer tyranny. So the tyrannies of the 20th century, the tyrannies of much of human history have been totalitarian governments, communism, Nazism, Islamism, and th threats like that. But in the new 21st century, tyranny can take many different forms, and I think that really is what this song is speaking to. It's speaking to economic tyranny, the tyranny of the rich men north of Richmond who would sell out their fellow countrymen, who would ship jobs overseas, things like that, just to earn a quick buck or try to make the or try to top the next quarterly return on the S&P 500 or something like that. It's also speaking to kind of a spiritual tyranny, kind of a lack of spiritual meaning which unfortunately the bipartisan liberal order elites of both parties have been all all too quick over the decades to abet spiritual decline in America, not supporting churches, synagogues, institutions of religion in general in America. So it really has become a, a cultural touchstone, a cultural rallying cry. And, you know, I, for one, look forward mm -hmm. to what Oliver Anthony can, can do next. Well, it's interesting because he said that he has now been offered millions of dollars now that he's had this enormous success, but he doesn't want that. He doesn't want to have uh, an enormous crew around him and be travelling the countryside with a, with a huge entourage performing. He said he's writing these songs because they're from the heart, because he's uh, uh, depressed and th that's where it's coming from. So it's, 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 it really is so authentic and I think that's what speaks to so many people. Now, Josh, you and I have spoken about soft on crime DAs in blue cities uh, a number of times. Uh, this story from New York really shows why so many are fleeing these 
Democrat strongholds for red cities. The New York Post reports a crazed man with a history of assaulting NYC workers bit, bit a police officer's ear, leaving him needing 20 stitches and then he was released without bail. A police source revealed that the 32-year-old Dante Bynan uh, had been arrested six times before, including three violent incidents. Um, there's been an incidents against law enforcement officers before Josh, and yet he's released. I mean, what is going on in places like New York? How can these citizens tolerate this lawlessness? Yeah, I mean, the without bail part of that to me is the most harrowing and frankly, just the most blood boiling. I mean, it, it, these stories, Rita, frankly, more than any other subcategory of stories that I discuss with you or on my own show, I mean, it, they make my blood boil, frankly. I mean, just, just watching this utter desecration of the rule of law, this lack of respect, the, this cultural dereliction of duty when it comes to respect for law enforcement, the men and women who black who back the blue. Now, New York State in particular had this horrific bail reform law going back three to four years ago or so. It's not exactly a new law there, but it, and they've tried to pare it back on the margins, is my understanding, but it continues to pay horrific dividends for the people of New York City, both civilians and law enforcement alike. And more generally speaking, what you're seeing play out time and time again, I mean, smash and grab has kind of become the new theme in Los Angeles, mm. in San Francisco, and many of these Soros DA cities in particular, in New York City, of course, with Alvin Bragg there in Manhattan is a Soros prosecutor city. So you're seeing a theme emerge here where, where Soros prosecutors are responsible for prosecuting, or as the case may be, not prosecuting crimes. You're seeing criminals and people who are inclined to do very bad deeds to both civilians and law enforcement alike, you're seeing them just get away with it. I mean, people respond to incentives at the end of the day, and this general kind of tenor, this tone that the left and the Democratic Party in America have reduced to this utter degradation, this disrespect for law enforcement, this culture of anarchy and lawlessness, of fetishizing crime and criminals, and holding the people that are the victims of crime, the victims of illegal immigration, saying that they are the people that are actually wrong. I mean, up is down, down is up. It, it's just a total reversal of all that is good, true, and beautiful. And it's real. it's been really sad from afar for me in Florida to watch some of these big blue cities fall to this mm. state. You know, in, in a situation like New York City, I have family there, and I kind of just worry for them, frankly. Oh, it's sad watching from afar as Australia because you visit these places and you can see the change within a very short period of time, particularly LA, San Francisco, New York, uh, the decay. And, and there was once where you'd visit these cities and go, I'd, I'd like to live here, no more. I, I have absolutely zero desire to reside in any of those places. Now, we've heard a lot in recent days about how a Hawaii official reportedly delayed releasing water critical to battling the devastating May wild, wildfires. Now, his name is... Calio Manuel, he's got a lot of attention. He's a former deputy director of the Hawaii Commission on Water Resource Management. And reportedly, he delayed releasing water for over five hours as the blaze raged, killing, well, we don't even know how many have been killed in this devastation. Let's hear about this philosophy behind water equity and revering water. This is a clip from last year. We've become used to looking at water as like something which we use and not necessarily something w that we revere as that thing that gives us life. Let water connect us and not divide us. Like we, we yeah. can share it, but it requires true conversations about equity. Josh, will there be a uh, thorough investigation into the response to these uh, devastating fires, including the the lack of preparation, the lack of land management, fire breaks, uh, cutting away native grasses and all the other factors that fueled the, the intensity of these fires. Well, first of all, I mean, what happened in Hawaii is just, it, this is tragic stuff, Rita. I mean, this is one of the worst natural disasters mm. in the United States in, in recent memory. And I say that as someone, I was actually living in Houston, Texas in 2017 when Hurricane Harvey, which is one of the which is really one of those catastrophic hurricanes to make U.S. landfall in the past half century. I was living there at the time and just watching what Hawaii is suffering from afar 
you know, I'm, I'm not going to compare the two, but it is at least on that level, if not worse. Over 100 people have died. That death toll number is almost assuredly tragically going to skyrocket because hundreds and hundreds are still missing. The whole town just utterly destroyed. Mm -hmm. And you watch videos like this, and obviously you have to ask, is this the reason? I mean, can you draw a cause and effect conclusion, a causal relationship from A to B? The answer is it's very difficult to tell. I mean, there were a lot of different factors involved here. You know, the uh, we think, we don't know, we think that the spark that caused the fire probably came from a power line that was struck down by these hurricane force winds. The energy company was told repeatedly in the lead up to this to de-energize the lines, to sap the power from the lines. They failed to do so. They are now being sued in a private capacity. Then you throw this, you know, this idiot, for lack of a better term, you throw that into the mix. And it, it, it look, just looks like a horrible, horrible situation from top to bottom. As far as accountability for this individual, it's kind of hard for me to see where that would come from. Hawaii is a very democratic stronghold, a far left, a very blue state. It's mm. unclear to me what kind of action the attorney general and governor there might take. At the federal level, Hawaii would fall under the, the jurisdiction of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which is a historically liberal court if, it, if litigation in the federal courts were to somehow reach there. The U.S. Attorney for uh, the, Ninth, the Ninth Circuit out there for Hawaii, I, I, is a, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure is a, is a liberal guy, Joe Biden appointee. So I hate to be the bearer mm. of bad news, but it, it, it's hard to see exactly where accountability would come from. Um, unless kind of the families of the victims themselves maybe would just really tear up the heartstrings and make such a concerted public appeal. But because I think there's so many different possible causes here to this whole mess, it's hard to kind of pinpoint one. I, I fear that this guy might get off the hook a little too easily, yeah. unfortunately, because that really is just terrible stuff that we just watched. Now, the uh, president has been shamed into finally visiting Maui. He's uh, taken a break from his week-long holiday to to visit the devastation. So that is something I guess uh, we can be uh, happy about. It's taken uh, taken some time. But just on what you were saying there, Josh, MBEC reports that wildfire experts in Hawaii have been warning for years that overgrown grasses were putting communities at extreme risk for wildfire destruction, but officials just simply failed to fund the work or introduce policies to uh, reduce the danger. Uh, Michael Walker, Hawaii's fire protection forester, urged state lawmakers last year to make what is a very small investment, $1.5 million for this fire preparedness, but the money was not forthcoming. So things like fire breaks, livestock grazing and water infrastructure for firefighters, well, it just did not happen. Josh Hammer, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Rita.